Greetings and welcome. I'm Father Jim Lees of the Congregation of Holy Cross, and I serve as the academic lead for the Notre Dame London Global Gateway. It's a particular delight to welcome you today to the 10th annual Notre Dame London Shakespeare Lecture in honor of Professor Sir Stanley Wells. We are delighted to be celebrating this year, this milestone 10th year with our collaborators, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the Shakespeare Institute. For those who may be new to Notre Dame, we are a large Catholic research university which highly values undergraduate teaching. We are global in scope with many gateways and centers throughout the world, the largest of which is our London Global Gateway, which is hosting this lecture today. I wanna to thank our partners from campus who've joined us in sponsoring this event, the Office of Notre Dame International, the College of Arts and Letters, Shakespeare at Notre Dame, the De Bartolo Performing Arts Center, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, and especially the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks to all of our co-sponsors who have contributed so much time and talent to bring this event to life. Before we get underway, I wanna highlight the Q&A button on the bottom right of your screen, on your Zoom webinar screen, which we encourage you to use. Later in the program, we'll have a Q&A segment and we'll address as many of your questions as possible. So please don't hesitate to submit them as they occur to you throughout our time together. To kick us off, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague and friend, Boyka Sokolova. Boyka is a longtime and much admired faculty member at the Notre Dame London Global Gateway, to whom we owe a huge debt of gratitude for her tireless work on the London Shakespeare Lecture over the past 10 years. I give you Boyka Sokolova, who will introduce our speaker today. Welcome, Boyka. Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10th annual lecture in honor of Professor Sir Stanley Wells, and a special welcome to Stanley himself. He's been an inspiration throughout these 10 years. Hello, I, I, can you hear me? Hello, lovely Hello, to you, and I'm great, very grateful to you to the university for this wonderful series of lectures. It's a great privilege to be able to attend all of them. And I'm only really sorry that I'm not with you in person today, but it's lovely to have my old friend, Peter Holland, giving this lecture. Welcome to everybody. Thank you, Sokolo, Boyka. This is a special occasion, uh, as you've heard. Today, we celebrate the first decade of the lecture which as of this year has a new dimension involving activities which will follow in its way. So watch this space, you'll be hearing more from us soon. The other reason for celebrating is that we are together in spite of the hardship and pain of the past year and that we have managed to reach out to a global audience. For those who are with us for the first time, I will offer here a very brief history of the lecture. For those who have been with us through the years, I hope this will bring back memories of good times and of unforgettable meetings ending up with a glass of wine at Trafalgar Hall in London. The Shakespeare lecture in honor of Professor Stanley Wells was designed to provide a space where both Shakespeare scholars and theatre practitioners can talk about their work. And I'm proud to say that it has attracted most eminent representatives from both fields. Academics like Anne Thompson have shared with us the conundrums and fun of editing Hamlet. Lois Potter regaled us with stories and wisdom about performance. Russell Jackson let us into secrets secrets from his experience uh, and his extensive work in theatre and Shakespeare film with Kenneth Branagh, while Michael Dobson shared insights into the stage histories of Shakespeare's comedies. On the practitioner side, theatre professionals like Nicholas Heitner, director of the Royal National Theatre, 
allowed us an insider view into what it is like to manage a major institution and into his work on Othello. Dominique Drongoul, then director of Shakespeare's Globe, took us on a journey across the world with the production of Hamlet, shown in 197 countries in 2016. Gregory Doran, director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, talked about his vision of Shakespearean theatre and the future of his theatre. Last year, we were feasted to a double bill of stars. Judy Dent, in conversation with Professor Wells, gifted us an, uh, an hour of sheer delight of reminiscences, ex prompt recitations and scintillating humour. Incidentally, all these events you can watch on our website. It is only opposite that the speaker of this celebratory 10th lecture should be someone like Peter Holland. Peter is a Macmill family professor in Shakespeare studies at the University of Notre Dame, and he was instrumental in setting up the lecture in the early stages. Peter has had an illustrious career as a Shakespearean and as a person who has enabled the development of the field. He was educated at Cambridge University, where afterwards he held several distinguished positions. Then he left Cambridge to become director of the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon and professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Birmingham. Since 2002, he has been working at Notre Dame. Peter is a distinguished literary historian, editor, textual critic, someone who always finds new pathways into the subject. His books, over 150 articles, Shakespeare editions and edited collections, testify to the breadth and scope of his talents. In his work, he has followed Shakespeare from his own day through the 18th century and into the present. Peter's latest book, Shakespeare and Forgetting, is due from Arden this June. And in the meantime, to keep himself busy, he has started editing um, King Lear for the Arden 4 series. Peter has lightly carried the burden of long-term publishing engagements and a variety of administrative duties, to mention but very few. For 19 years, he was the editor of Shakespeare Survey, he co-edited the 18 volumes of Great Shakespeareans, a wide-ranging series, which is a monument of scholarship. And uh, he is currently uh, editor of Arden Shakespeare Series 4. And I can go on, but we'll stop here to allow the man himself to tell us uh, about Shakespeare in trailers. Uh, something I anticipate and look forward to very much, like all the rest. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you, Boyd. <laughs> and uh, let's hope we just change the view now. Uh, and Boyka switches off her mic. Good. Uh, my great thanks to Boyka for that introduction, and particularly Boyka for for your time spent inventing this series. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful series to participate in, albeit at a distance. Uh, I was present when Nick Heitner was speaking and introduced him, but otherwise I've been viewing the goings on in London at, at, at from all the way from Indiana, uh, which is where I am now. Uh, I am honoured to be able to honour Stanley, uh, dear friend, extraordinary scholar, somebody who epitomises everything that we aspire to as academics. It, it, it is really, truly an honor to be part of that sequence. Uh, and let me make further thanks. Uh, I particularly want to thank, uh, if uh, 
the four graduate students on that screen, uh, Emily, Valentina, Lau and Michael, uh, who uh, were in a class of mine and suggested that we started to explore Shakespeare movie trailers. Uh, and I, I, I'm very grateful to them for the idea. And I owe a special thanks to Jessica Ritter Holland, uh, who was, when I began this project, working at Market Cast, uh, researching for uh, film trailers for the various Hollywood studios, looking at, at proposed trailers and deciding whether they were going to work with the different audiences that they were intended for. And I should say, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, that Jessica is my daughter. So to begin, on the 17th of November, 1998, and for a while thereafter, something very strange happened in cinema going. Across the US and far beyond, people bought tickets at their local movie theaters with no interest in watching the movie, uh, but only in order to watch the trailers, or to be more precise, to watch one trailer in particular, the first teaser trailer for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace a movie that was then scheduled for release the following year. Dubbed the most anticipated two minutes of film ever, this was the first footage from the Star Wars franchise since 1983 when Return of the Jedi had appeared. Star Wars fans in their tens of thousands were desperate to see what George Lucas created. As Variety reported, nearly two thirds of the people, uh, 500 people in an afternoon showing of The Siege in Los Angeles walked out after seeing the trailer. And movie theaters across the country reported other fans doing the same thing. By the very first evening, several fans had uploaded pirated versions of the trailer onto websites. This years before the start of YouTube. In the first 48 hours, 200,000 fans downloaded the trailer from those sites. In many ways, the trailer was more successful than the movie. And of course, the tease was intended for an audience already totally committed to the hype of the next episode, first in the sequence, fourth to be made in the then supposedly nine film sequence of the narrative. It's a bit like the moment when the Lord Chamberlain's men announced in probably 1595 that they would be playing Richard II, episode one, though the fifth to appear, of what would be an eight-play sequence, though nobody, perhaps not even Shakespeare, knew that at that time. The most the Lord Chamberlain's men probably did was to announce the new play from the stage and on the bills stuck up around town. Now, of course, marketing is central and an expensive part of the economics of film. And trailers are a crucial part of this operation. Trailers in the old days were made by the studio, now usually by an independent trailer production company. The work that in the popular 2006 rom-com, The Holiday, we see Amanda, the character played by Cameron Diaz, doing in LA. Here's a little script excerpt of her at work, though of course we don't see the trailer that she's working on. I'll leave it to you to read it, but I particularly like the idea of a happy red rather than Scorsese red. Trailers are extensively analyzed and researched and tested on audiences before distribution, creating their own ancillary companies for market research. They mark a point where the filmmakers are far from being in control of what we might now call messaging, instead becoming a mediating moment between production and consumption a representation of the film, but not a representation by the film. Their complex interventions in the constructions of anticipated meanings in the movie being trailed are part of their effectiveness as they seek the particular responses that will encourage us, or at least those of us that they particularly want to encourage, to choose in the future to buy a movie ticket. At their best, these are two minute miniature works of art that beautifully make their marketing points. And yet Shakespeare trailers are a barely noticed part of Shakespeare studies. When I started this project, I looked on the World Shakespeare Bibliography online, searching its more than 125,000 records. And I came up only with a play called Shakespeare in the Trailer Park, which isn't exactly about trailers at all. There's a little scholarly work out there on the topic now, uh, especially in Emma French's 2006 book, Selling Shakespeare to Hollywood, with its focus on what she calls the manner in which Hollywood marketed Shakespeare 
and Shakespeare was marketed to Hollywood. And I shall, of course, be considering some of those same concerns that she was con concerned with. But my focus is going to be a little wider, dominated by but not exclusive to Hollywood. I'm going to be primarily concerned with words rather than images, words on screen and words in voiceover, words spoken by characters and words that the trailer speaks. Now, think of a recent movie trailer, say over the last 30 years, and you're aware that you're thinking of a template. Take one obvious but peculiar fact. The voiceover for US trailers, for the long period in which trailers used this device, it's now fallen out of fashion, the voice was always male. The same gravelly, dark, comfortingly authoritative kind of voice every time. Now, quite why, as Andy Medhurst put it in an article on what he called the big T's, quite why the trail is male, isn't fully answered by his suggestion that when the lights go down and we're helpless in the dark, we still want masculinity in that godlike voice from the ether booming out its otherworldly sales pitch. But it wasn't always quite like that. British films of the 1940s and 50s used a male voiceover that spoke in the best BBC version of RP, speaking at a speed about three times the speed of that of the current US norm. And it's the one most often used for the voiceover for the newsreel of the period like Pathé News. The best presentation of a trailer template though is in a superb parody called How to Make a Blockbuster Movie Trailer first posted on YouTube in August 2017, which is, as a trailer expert said to me, scarily accurate. And we're going to run that clip, and I want you to turn up the volume on your speakers because then you'll get the full effect. Have you ever wondered? about this particular thing. Because it turns out that that thing is real. That thing I referred to earlier, well, it's happening and it will destroy us all. Someone has to stop this thing. And that someone is you. You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? who can stop this thing. You are that person. Now take my hand! For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Reaction. What happens, though, when a trailer works very strongly against the template? The trailer for Oliver Parker's 1995 film of Othello opens with an unusually long narration in, of course, voiceover. There it is, and I'm not going to read it out. By the time this very long statement is complete, portentous underscore and all, we're well over halfway through the, f the trailer, some 76 seconds out of 112 in all. And then there's a line from Iago and one from Othello, 
And then the voiceover returns with the identification of the production company and the three, three name cast list. Uh, uh, the cast run, the term for the list of the stars of the film. And then there's one brief line from Iago and then a one word ending from the voiceover, the title, Othello, to go with a single word that was on screen at that point in a fake early modern script. And we're out with the billing block, the industry term for the panel with far too many words on it that lists all the stars, the composer, director, producer, executive producer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a little thinking about the nature of that text. First, three of the snippets of Shakespeare are culled from one scene. Iago at the start of the jealousy scene, and then later in it, Othello, later in the same scene with a repetition that isn't in Shakespeare, and then Iago from a while later still. Given the opening emphasis on the linearity of narration, the setting up of the plot as tightly compacted by synopsis as the trailer makers dare, the snippets of Shakespeare act as really strong pointers. The crucial start of the jealousy plot and the proposal for the climactic act of violence. Now that selection is as nothing, of course, with a grabbing of shots from all over the film. Trailer montage is based on immediacy of response and a shot here of say, Cassio in bed with Desdemona, a shot that only makes sense as a visualization, literally a projection of Othello's jealous imaginings still functions really effectively in the trailer as a signifier of the films and the plays endless fascination with what can and cannot be seen. It's voyeurism and teasing of the sight of sex, permissible or not. Trailers, if you'll pardon the pun, work to unmoor a shot from its position in the thread of the film's unraveling, dislocating it into a montage sequence that denies the linearity of narrative and localized meaning to construct that other effect that trailers yearn to create the emphasized collection or collocation of similar shot materials to define the generic particularities of the movie. If you want to entice the audience demographic or demo as it's usually called, that likes one kind of film, then make sure your trailer has as much as possible of that genre visible. Now I'll return to the denomination, indeed nomination of genre in a moment. But secondly, let me note the structure of the cast run sentence. Castle Rock Entertainment is proud to. It's, it's an unusual form for mentioning the star's name. And I hear it as a kind of displacement from the much more common use of this kind of register as a signal of a high culture film. Not only, though also, carrying the implications of a piece of art house cinema packaged for general distribution. Production companies do not register and manifest their pride in say, a Batman movie or in horror franchises. The pride is not in the particularity of Fishburne or Jacob or Brana as leading cast members, but implicitly in the company's involvement in a Shakespeare film, that ultimate marker of high culture, a culture assumed to be predicated on elite exclusivity that is still implicitly formulated as antithetical to the popularity of cinema. Now, let me compare that with moments in trailers for two of the films that Laurence Olivier was involved in. The first is the rolling title at the start of a trailer for Olivier's 1944 Hamlet. The rank organization presents with profound pride the chronicle history of William Shakespeare's Henry V. The rest of this role is itself indicative of marketing strategy. Note that it's explicitly directed at US audiences, that it's about thrill and excitement and the use of the latest technology. Superscope was a brief 1950s rival to Cinemascope. And how you might be wondering was a 1944 film reshot in the new technology of a decade later? Well, the answer is it wasn't. This is the trailer for the 1950s re-release of Henry V, and it was possible only because the original film was cropped top and bottom, so that its aspect ratio now matched the widescreen of scope, whether super scope or cinema scope. 
Incidentally, the 1944 original trailer for, for this movie lasts six minutes and is one of the dullest I have ever seen. But my point, of course, is that use of profound pride as the metonymic sign for Shakespeare. When a film company speaks of pride, it's probably speaking of Shakespeare. But the second parallel is from the trailer for the 1965 Othello, starring Olivier, but directed on stage by John Dexter and on film by Stuart Burge, made after the end of the stage run at the National Theatre. This trailer is almost entirely a shot of Olivier perched on the edge of a desk in an elegant room, supposedly at Shepperton Studios where the film was made and talking straight to camera for an uninterrupted four minutes. Towards the end, Olivier's script splits the potential audience into two into, in his thinking about their future response to the film. Many of you may reawaken an interest in the works of Shakespeare, but for most, we will have succeeded if during its limited engagements in your theater or cinema, we provide the evening of full-blooded entertainment that the author intended Othello to be. Now this is spoken of over shots and a certain amount of sound from the sword fighting and chaos of the mutiny provoked by Iago by getting Cassio drunk. I'm fascinated by that careful choice of verb on Olivier's part. Not that some of the audience may awaken an interest in the plays, but reawaken, defining them as that broad group of averagely educated people who had to study Shakespeare in school and now need to have the pleasure reawakened if they ever had it. And that use of full-blooded and the choice of clips is designed to reassure viewers that the film isn't dull, precious and difficult to follow. Sit back. Enjoy the fighting. It's okay, even if it's Shakespeare. The division in audiences can be reflected in a release strategy. Olivier's 1948 Hamlet was first shown in the US on a very limited number of screens, all in major cities, with plenty of emphasis on the film as an educational opportunity for schools and colleges. After the movie won the 1949 Best Picture and Best Actor Oscars, it was shown with a new tagline on the posters clearly designed for a much broader audience demo. Shrouded in mist, clad in rusty armor, a horrifying specter stalks the great stone battlements of the ancient castle. Its one command is kill, kill, kill. And that brings me to my third and last point about the script for that 1995 Othello that I began this, this sequence in, with, and indeed the full extent of its images and on-screen text. Nowhere in that trailer does the word Shakespeare appear. The suppression of the word, rendering it invisible, something that is not uncommon in Shakespeare film trailers, seems to me to function differently in different circumstances, and I'm going to come back to one example much later in this talk. Here, I suspect it's the pitch of the movie as sexy costume drama that means the Shakespeare fear factor must be avoided. If you're going to see it because of one or more of the stars or because of the gorgeous location photography or the bedroom scenes, then you may not want to be reminded that it's by Shakespeare. And this is essentially different from, say, the suppression of the word Shakespeare in the trailer for Gil Younger's hugely popular movie, 10 Things I Hate About You. For that film, not only in the trailer, but also in its film credits, completely erases Shakespeare from its text. When I used to use the film in class a while back, not now when it so clearly belongs to a prehistory of cinema going for 99% of my students, I would always have a student or three surprised to find that this film which they'd seen and enjoyed was in fact a Shakespeare adaptation of Tammy of the Shrew. Now I've been using the 1995 Othello as a representation of the aberrancy on the unusualness of seeking to represent narrative in a trailer. It's often plainly difficult to discern from trailers how plot is operating. There's a well-known example in the trailer for the movie Thelma and Louise, released in 1991, 
which because of MGM's concern to make sure that the female demographic was locked in, was revised to ignore all explanations as to why the two women were, were running away in favor of shots that emphasized their relationship. Sometimes though, the remaking is designed to accommodate problems of recognition. Let me use as an example, the second trailer released for the truly terrible 2013 version of Romeo and Juliet, directed by Carlo Carlay. The film would appear in October, but the first trailer appeared in April 2013, six months earlier. Voiceover, the standard male voice, quotes the prince's last couplet, for never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. And then it had text cards interspersed with plenty of action shots and love shots and sexy shots from the film before the cast run and title. Here is the series of six te text cards that were shown, but clearly this didn't work. In July, still months before the film was released, a second trailer was sent out and it started with the same voiceover, but then a different sequence of text shown as words on screen. The most powerful love story, as it was described in the first trailer, has now become the most dangerous love story. And I note the active force of that card that says, risk it all for love. Is it that Romeo and Juliet risk it all? Or is it an encouragement to us to risk it all? It seems to me more like an imperative. We should risk it all for love. And at the end, the hashtag forbidden love reminds us that we're in the Twitter world and we might feel enthusiastic enough about the movie to follow this lead. And the lead is not a lead Romeo and Juliet, hashtag Romeo and Juliet, but another noun phrase, like the ones that have become that sequence, forbidden desires, sworn enemies, forbidden love. The list effect here is a frequent mode for trailers to define the kind of content that they're wanting to make us believe the film to be about. But the distinction I'm beginning to set out between two forms of trailer, on the one hand, narrative, and on the other, a list for genre, is most potently present in a comparison I want to make now, allowing myself the sheer luxury of running two complete trailers, trailers for the same film, Julie Taymor's version of Titus Andronicus as Titus in 1999. The first, the trailer for the film, and the second, for its move to video. Two trailers that for me exemplify the tension between the poles of narrative and plot material uh, on, on the one hand and the fragments of narrative uh, that, that and clips chosen to show generic concerns at the other. And if I can manage to do this effectively, I want to move to show you both examples. walks wide, spacious for rape and villainy. This was thy daughter. He the fall of an empire <laughs> is nothing compared to the descent of a man. I am revenge, sent from the infernal kingdom. Revenge! <laughs> now do I come to thee! Go to the Goths and raise an army there. And in the Empress Court there is a queen. Good murder. Stop her! For those who think revenge is sweet, I shall grind your bones to dust. Taste this. <laughs> Madness and the ultimate.
sacrifice of love. Academy Award winner Anthony Hopkins, Academy Award winner Jessica Lange, Tony Award winner Alan Cumming, Laura Frazier, Harry Lennox, Jonathan Reese Myers. Titus. Welcome, my gracious lord. And welcome all. <laughs> What's most impressive for me in here is not the tagline, the fall of an empire is nothing compared with the descent of a man, nor the joke in, for those who think revenge is sweet, taste this, followed by the shot of Hopkins carefully referencing Hannibal Lecter in the snap of his teeth. Sorry, my screen is not moving properly. There we go. Uh, nor even the circling back to the Thiestian banquet in the final tag from Tony Award winner jo Julie Tamor comes a feast of power, lust, madness, and the ultimate sacrifice of love. Rather, it's the remarkable way in which the brilliant selection of phrases constructs a perfectly formed and acceptable synopsis of the plot of a play that 99.9% .9 of the potential audience will barely have heard of, let alone read or seen. Here, the primary concern of the trailer is to use narrative to define genre and form. There's no shortage of indication of the kind of spectacle that Titus is, no lack of suggestion of the Fellini-esque vision that shapes the film's visual vocabulary, but all of it is placed less in the service of the tagline culture that is so powerfully a driver in tra trailer making, as if taglines are the only way we have of making sense of a movie and trailers or on posters, than it is in the service of inviting our engagement with a sequence that is predicted. Titus's descent and a complex web of revenge. If you had to create a two minute summary of Titus, I don't know that you could do much better than this. So now let me turn to the second of my examples uh, and that's the trailer for the move to DVD. Not a single moment of speech, not a single line of voiceover, not a care in the world for narrative, not a fragment of interest in predictive plotting. This is for me an equally brilliant demonstration of the polar opposite of how to construct a trailer. The supreme flashiness of the style of this filmmaking shows what a different audience might want. Not story, not character, just sex, rock, camp, spectacle, all of which Titus magnificently and sensationally provides. We might say that the opposite of trailer as synopsis of narrative is synopsis of illustration of a noun string. And what better way to describe both Tamor's Titus and perhaps Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus as well than as a representation of decadence, lust, madness, passion, and betrayal. 
Well, that might be overly sympathetic to this reading of the film, let alone the play, but if the aim, and what other aim is there, is to encourage a demographic to explore something that otherwise they would steadfastly resist and deny and be interested in, then the line, if you think you know Shakespeare, think again, is remarkably effective. Now, if I'd given you the noun string, decadence, lust, madness, passion, betrayal, uh, and asked you which Shakespeare play it was used to describe, it probably wouldn't have taken too long for you to reach the right answer. Run through Shakespeare plays with mad characters and combine that with some decadence, and it's a short step. Try this string though, obsession, hatred, friendship, love, and so on. It's much trickier. It's actually the sequence used in a trailer for Joss Whedon's 2013 film of Much Ado About Nothing. But the long list of 12 nouns doesn't frame and control the rhythm of the trailer. We're three quarters of the way into the trailer before these words start to appear. And they appear at a rapid pulsing rhythm in groups of four. Obsession, hatred, friendship, love. Loyalty, power, deceit, truth. Sex, dishonesty, devotion, deception. Now you might hold in your mind the five abstractions for Titus, but unless your memory is simply exceptional, you stand no chance of hanging on to these groupings, each of which appears on screen for barely a second. Whedon's film, which I greatly admire, was made in black and white to save the problem of color matching, color matching in an extremely rapid shoot. The trailers work to add splashes of color, both within a shot so that the glass that Claudio holds is in the trailer full of a yellow liquid and in the text shown on screen. And you might have thought that by this late point in the trailer, the style, the genre of the film had been or should have been adequately achieved. But what both this trailer and the second so-called international trailer for the film are much more concerned to wrestle with is the mere fact of Shakespeare and the unlikely collocation of this playwright and this film director. When the film is defined on screen as being from the director of Avengers Assemble, the early title for what would be better known simply as the Avengers, there's clearly an anxiety about what this mixing of Whedon and Shakespeare will produce. Black and white suggests art house movie, and the trailers foreground that the film had been toured to a number of film festivals, including the major one in Toronto, long before release. How Shakespeare functions within this is less a matter of how the, the list of abstract nouns function to, accept, uh, to suggest accessibility, than how to bridge between a Marvel's comic franchise movie director and Shakespeare. And in part, it's done by the opening text of the trailer on two text cards. The course of true love never did run smooth. Yes, we know that doesn't come from much ado, but A, it functions as a quotation that's familiar enough and accessible enough, uh, B, accessible enough to work efficiently. Sometimes the problem with which a trailer is trying to grapple can be solved by judicious use of quotations from reviews. Here there are three about 45 seconds into the trailer, the first brilliantly split into two. Whedon has created a Shakespeare adaptation that will please just about everyone. And the second reassuring us that it's comedy. Forget about your King Lears, this will be a light comedy with the clips showing, for instance, visual gags of Beatrice missing a step. The third conveniently resolves the, com, uh, the conjunction of the two names. This is the funniest Shakespeare I can recall. Joss Whedon and Shakespeare are a match made in heaven. You'll note that I haven't bothered to record the source of the review, though each is carefully given in the trailer. None of the sources are in themselves significant. It's the quotation, not the critic, that matters here in easing Whedon's fans towards the film from Buffy the Vampire Slayer via the Avengers to Much Ado might seem to them a deviation, but the trailer reassures us. The second trailer does much less as if it's newly confident that the messaging will work. It offers first a statement of the nature of the adaptation, combining vision with cliche spread across four screens. From Joss Whedon, acclaimed director of Avengers Assemble, comes a bold new vision of a timeless classic. 
and then three different comments from critics. You've never seen Shakespeare done like this. A masterpiece, second to none. I take it that the first is encouraging rather than a warning, and the second is a quality reassurance, and the third suggests the frequency of, well, what? Much ado screen versions, hardly. Branagh's was the first significant one and Whedon's the next. All Shakespeare screen versions, mm, possibly. The critic's quote is in effect a rather meaningless standard, but nonetheless, when aligned with the festival laurels that garlanded it, it's suggestive of a high quality film. It's as if the first is aimed more deliberately at an audience with little interest in Shakespeare, while the second reassures a more high cultural market that this is a version for them. And this high-low culture clash is beautifully rethought in the opening voiceover for another film. In the tradition of Some Like It Hot and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, uh, comes the classic romantic comedy that proves sometimes clothes really do make the man. William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. And now Trevor Nunn's 1996 Twelfth Night is in the tradition of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert and Tootsie, rather than Tootsie being in the tradition of Twelfth Night. Film is the dominant tradition here, absorbing the history of theatre into itself so that a Shakespeare movie belongs in the chronology of film, not the longer history of cross-dressing performance. These negotiations with Shakespeare as a name, as source, as quotation and misquotation work very differently when the film is not of Shakespeare, but about Shakespeare. For Shakespeare in Love, the distribution company made no fewer than 20 different 30 second spots for TV. And it's not the representation of Shakespeare that intrigues me in this sequence, except by absence. There are very few shots of him as writer used anywhere in all of those 20 trails, but rather something we could identify as a kind of generic indeterminacy about the film. Oddly, like the kind of anxiety that W.B. Yeats had about Shakespeare's refusal to write anything that Yeats would see as tragedy. Though Shakespeare in Love is not exactly Polonian in, in achieving the tragical, comical, historical, pastoral apex of generic multiplicity, it gets surprisingly close to it. And that makes it difficult to be quite sure how to market it. I should explain that one reason for the sheer number of spots that were made was the success of the film. New spots were made when reviews started to appear, and then for the six Golden Globe nominations, and then the three Golden Globe wins, and then the 13 Oscar nominations, and then the seven Oscar wins. From the first though, the company found it had to create multiple spots in an attempt to include the variety of character and genre approaches that the film encouraged, and hence the range of demographics in the audience that it sought to attract. One could be focused on Viola de Lesseps as a young lover, one on her as a would-be actor, one on sword fighting and action excitement, one on visual comedy, one on Shakespeare and writer's block, and so on. Given that with the inevitable tops and tails of information and the need for the voiceover always to give the title and rating, rated R, there isn't much time to cover anything much in the 30 seconds of trail. The campaign's refusal to settle on one definition of the film, therefore, worked very much in its favor. Very few of the spots have anything much to hint at as plot. One, playfully and for me very effectively, uses lines from the film script to comment on the film's title. The nation's top critics have a new favorite film. Fenniman, what's it called? Voiceover. Shakespeare in Love. Shakespeare, good title. The first, sign is set, uh, first line is set against a shot of the Globe audience applauding wildly near the film's end. The second comes from the opening sequence. There is time during the third for two shots, one of Shakespeare kissing Viola and one of the two in bed together. And the fourth is Shakespeare's response to Marlowe's telling him that of the title of the play that Marlowe is writing, The Massacre of Paris, good title. It can be followed in the spot by no fewer than five review quotes, each shown on screen and heard in voiceover. 
romantic and ravishing, too enthusiastic, thumbs up. New York Times raves it's an intoxicating and glamorous romance, while Newsweek calls it a glorious film that makes movie going fun again, and from Entertainment Weekly, the most satisfying film of the year. All of this comes across as a kind of virtuosic mini celebration of the film, and the word celebration itself becomes key when for one spot and one spot only, they try a tagline defining the film as a celebration of life, love, and the creative process. And the very last of the 20 finally uses the adjective that the sequence has been skirting around and a willingness to use the film's generic range to its marketing advantage. As the voiceover puts it, the sexiest movie of the year is now the best picture of the year and the winner of seven Academy Awards, including and so on. And then a review quote from the LA Times, it's everything you want a movie to be. Trailers often don't have the chance to be everything their makers want them to be. Just as on occasion they may include a clip that hit the cutting room floor by the time the film is released, so they are often unable to use the film's music soundtrack since that is often not completed and recorded until a later stage in post-production. Hence, for instance, the music is somewhat arbitrarily chosen in many examples. Karl Orff's O Fortuna from Carmina Burana appears with remarkable frequency. The trailer for Trevor Nunn's Twelfth Night that I referred to earlier uses Mozart's Eine Kleine Nacht music, but the film doesn't. And the Log Crane in McKellen Richard III uses William Walton's Belshazzar's Feast, primarily because it's got a big choral sound. But if one does recognize the source, the fall of one kingdom seems an appropriate intertextual reference. Again, the Walton doesn't appear in the film's score. But what, finally, if there's no film to trail? What would a trailer look like if there were nothing to see or hear that would be part of the finished product? Here's an example. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men. This little world. This precious stone set in the silver sea. Which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot. This earth. This realm, this England. The Royal Shakespeare Company production of Richard II with David Tennant in the title role. Live from Stratford-upon-Avon in cinemas around the world. In the run-up to a live from broadcast, there is no film material to use. It's different when the broadcast will be constructed out of the taping of two or more different performances, as has been the case at the Globe, for instance. Different too when the broadcast is sometime after filming. But if it is indeed live at the moment of transmission, as well as filming, then there is no film to trail. All there is, is the marketing image, which was also used for the DVD box, and itself based on a photo shoot many, many months before the design decisions about costume. Here's what Richard actually did look like, not look like David Tennant as Doctor Who. The voiceover for the trail isn't even that of Michael Pennington, who would play John of Gaunt. 
By the time of, say, the 2016 RSC Hamlet, starring Papa Esiadou and directed by Simon Godwin, there were three web trailers created for the production. The first, primarily a trailer for the theatre production rather than for its broadcast, is the 2016 graduation party at Wittenberg University, filmed, as it were, on someone's cell phone and allowing the soundtrack to pick up the names like Hamlet being spoken. It ends with someone bringing Hamlet his cell phone, which is ringing, and when in shock he holds it up to his ear, we hear a voice from the cell phone calling, remember me. The production itself opened with a graduation ceremony, and so this proves to anticipate the production, but nobody could know that. Its real impact is to push a young student-y kind of atmosphere with a predominantly black British cast and a modern setting. This new concept of something scripted and filmed for the trailer with resonances for the production, but filmed neither on stage nor using a moment from the production became a new template for the ROC's trailer making. Advanced publicity for Chris Luscombe's 2017 Twelfth Night made much of Adrian Edmondson's being cast as Malvolio in the marketing still. Here it is. And so the trailer has the actor's voiceover from the letter scene as we watch him in a room, not a stage set, musing to the sound of his own thoughts as he dresses in yellow stockings to generate the image that brands the production. The second Hamlet trailer, also a trailer for the, the theatre production, splices comments from the director with Vox Pop interviews of predominantly American college students, apparently a very deliberately chosen demographic. Unlike, say, the largely British middle-aged audience interviewed for a similar trailer for the 2017 Twelfth Night. And finally, for each, there is a full-scale trailer for the cinema simulcast, using footage of the production, now filmed in advance of the screening precisely in order to make a proper kind of trailer possible. And what do we make of the trailer, though not the poster, for the National Theatre Live broadcast from the Donwell Warehouse of a production starring Tom Hiddleston that manages in the trailer, it does on the poster, manages never to say that it's a Shakespeare play. That it assumes that everybody knows that Coriolanus is a Shakespeare play, or more likely that the fans of, of Tom Hiddleston really don't care who the play is by. New technologies, new trailers. What the RSC is engaged in, like most theatre companies, is the creation of internet trailers for theatre productions, irrespective of the possibility of live cast screenings. These stage, not film, trailers are a wholly new phenomenon in the conceptualization of theatre marketing that now demands our attention. Even student productions of Shakespeare at Notre Dame by the nicely named not so royal Shakespeare Company have at least one online trailer on their YouTube or Facebook channels. From the epic grandeur of 1940s bombast to the homemade quality of these multiply amateur pieces, filmmaking trails both film and theater. It's a new site for study, a new global Shakespeare phenomenon, which we can all explore. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's a, a delight to have you here and we're uh, grateful for the exposition and review of Shakespeare in trailers. At this point, we'll ask Peter, who has been described by one of my colleagues as an international rock star where Shakespeare is concerned, to address some of the questions that are coming via Zoom in the Q&A feature. So I would ask anyone who um, would wish to submit a question at this time to feel free to do so. In the meantime, we're gonna welcome forward, and it's an honor for us to welcome, uh, Paul Edmondson of the Shakespeare Play Birthplace Trust and Michael Dobson of the Shakespeare Institute to offer the first of our questions for Peter today. Michael, are you going to go first or shall I go first? Well, they mentioned your name first. I think you should go first. Peter, thank you for that wonderful talk. Thank you for making me want to revisit some of those films that you reminded me of, especially Julie Taymor's Titus, which just seeing the trailer again made me excited again about that film. Um, I was thinking, you know, I've got my complete works here, the Oxford edition. 
the, the closest Shakespeare comes to having a trailer in one of the plays is the epilogue to Henry the Fourth, Part Two, and it goes like this: mm. One word more, I beseech you, if you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of sweat unless already a be killed with your hard opinions. Now that seems to straddle the, the two kinds of genre. It anticipates something which is not there and it reminds us of something that we can, we've already seen and we can, as it were, project onto the future. Um, and, and maybe maybe Shakespeare hasn't even started writing Henry V um, yet by the time his audience has heard that. I suppose my question really is taking us back to, as it were, the original. Um, how would we, how would we characterize, as it were, the anticipation of performance in in Shakespeare's in Shakespeare's London? Well, I, I I love that as a question. I I'd want to add in a, a, a second trailer in in a Shakespeare play, uh, but it's a kind of curious r reverse trailer, and that's at the in the epilogue, not to Henry the Fourth Part Two, but to Henry the Fifth. Ah, uh, yes. Which talks about the fact that Henry will not reign long, that his son in infant bound, bands will be crowned king and will lose France and make all England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown. Mm -hmm. And it's a trailer for the Henry the Sixth plays that Shakespeare had written some years earlier. So in case you hadn't realized members of the audience as you're watching Henry V, I wrote some more plays that carry on this story and you and you could have seen them. We've shown them often, which oft our stage has shown. It's, it's about how you connect things together. We're used to this in Hollywood blockbusters when the end of one film in a franchise will tell us, you know, Superman will be back, uh, Batman will be back, uh, the Marvel comic franchise, the Marvel comic uh, film universe will be back. And we're, we're absolutely used to that. What was so unusual, I think, about the Star Wars example I started with is Lucas had mapped out nine films. And he announced when the first Star Wars film came, this is episode four, five, six. And then it all stopped. And he didn't go on to then to make episode seven, which perhaps you or I might have done. He went back to make episode one. He wanted, the, as it were, the sequence of three that are prequels. So the prequels then become part of the marketing strategy that takes us back towards the main films and then towards the next trilogy that completes the sequence. So I'm interested in how marketing is, is, is in these cases and in Shakespeare movies, often talking, and in Shakespeare's own plays, talking about sequence. There isn't, as it were, Twelfth Night Part Two. There, if you believe that there was, uh, that Much Ado is Love's Labour's One, as the Royal Shakespeare Company did at one stage, then you market Love's Labour's Lost with its sequel, Much Ado About Nothing as Love's Labour's One, even though it has no connection in narrative. But it's about that enticement to the audience, keep watching these movies. Thank you very much. Michael, you seem, um, uh, uh, as virtual backgrounds are wont to do, to be standing outside the windmill pub rather than comfortably at home or in your office. Would that I were, um, and would that the weather were as it looks uh, on this uh, artfully designed piece of marketing um, in front of which I am digitally posed. Um, but no, uh, the windmill, alas, is still shut, though I live in hopes, it being, as, as you know very well, the senior common room uh, by any other name. Um, at the Institute, which is the building behind me for the benefit uh, of our viewers. Um, Paul neatly touches on the question of the missing paratexts, the missing trailers, um, to what extent we think Shakespeare's audience even knew the title of the play they were going to see, uh, to what extent those titles set up expectations, which the plays either set out um, to satisfy or set out to complicate or even um, defy. I mean, I'm struck by how many of the examples you talk about from the cinema are exercises in trying to get round the baggage that comes with the word Shakespeare for most cinema 
audiences. Um, and I'm, I have to confess, being slightly disappointed not to have seen any publicity materials uh, for the Spaghetti West and Johnny Hamlet, uh, which, because that title might have told people it was based on Shakespeare, was replaced uh, with um, Kella Storia Sporco del West, that mm. dirty story in the West, which I still think is the best alternative title uh, that Hamlet um, has ever had. <laughs> um, but presumably, I mean, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that you should return to editing Shakespeare survey uh, beautifully though you did that job. Do you think um, we're going to need a separate review slot in Shakespeare journals, not only describing and reviewing Shakespeare films and Shakespeare stage productions, but also reviewing the trailers? Um, which often, as you say, have a wider circulation than the productions, since not everybody who sees the trailer then buys a ticket. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would love to think that would be worth doing. One of the things that, that I'm intrigued about, and, and it's very difficult to get hold of the materials in order to track it down, is the full range of trailers for a particular film. Yeah. So in the old days, Hollywood made one trailer, and that was the one that was used in the US, mm -hmm. in whatever worldwide distribution it might have, it was all the same. Now the trailers are endlessly remade. So the trailer for France is different from the trailer for Germany, it is different from the trailer for Japan or China and so on. And it's virtually impossible to get hold of all those different trailers to see how the film is being rethought. That's why I'm, I'm so fascinated by that sequence of trailers that's on the DVD version of Shakespeare in Love, the deluxe collector's edition, mm -hmm. 20 different 30 second spot, uh, spots, because it shows a, a film company desperately trying to rethink what it's got as it's encouraging more and more people to actually buy a ticket. And these are, these are trails not for distribution in the movie theater, these are TV trails. And, and again, that, that is a crucial modern difference, just as now, of course, we have web trails. When you go, as I occasionally do, to a wonderful website called traileraddicts.com, uh, you can sometimes get two, three or four trailers for a particular film, uh, but not, as it were, the complete set. And you mentioned what was happening in, in, in as it were, trailing Shakespeare. Um, and Paul asked the question about early modern marketing. We don't know really what the bills that were put up around town about a play said, because we don't have a single one from the period. So we don't know what, what they read. We do know that Dryden says in a letter in the 1690s about a play by Congreve, and he's seen the playbill, that it is the first time Dryden has ever seen the author's name on a playbill. The word Congreve appears on that playbill and, and Dryden is, is surprised and I suspect deeply envious about the fact that Congreve got his name onto the playbill and Dryden right at the end of his long career never got his name onto, onto the playbills for his show. Um, so that whole way in which whether the audience, or whether the audience could know the name of the playwright or whether a, a buyer of the play when it's published knew the name of the playwright since so many plays were published without the author's name on it. And so many Shakespeare plays, you know, we know that moment at which Shakespeare play, Shakespeare's name starts to appear on publications of his own plays, some of which it's the second or third quarter before his, his name is actually there because suddenly the name Shakespeare has become a selling point. And it's a useful brand, not least because it keeps the two of you employed at the Shakespeare Institute and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. God bless it. Thank you. Thank Paul. you. And Michael, thanks so much for joining us and for your support of, of this lecture annually. Um, at this time, we're going to move to some of the questions, the many questions that you've submitted. We won't get to them all, but we're grateful for your submitting them. Uh, Peter, to start, I wonder, um, the... Um, discussion about, you mentioned a tension between the highbrow and Main, and Main Street and the mainstream audiences that the trailers reach to. Are there particular films or trailers that were particularly effective in bridging that gap between, you know, the one audience or the other? Well, there are trailers that I think are effective in doing it, but, but are they effective in doing what they were supposed to do? That's an entirely different question. 
okay? Um, I think that those two trailers for Julie Taymor's Titus are simply brilliant. I mean, I, I particularly like the second one and it's complete refusal to give us a single line of dialogue uh, or anything that tells us about plot and simply to bombard us with image after image after image in tiny, tiny little fragments that say, if you want to see more of things that look like this, come and see this movie. Um, I mean, that, that I think is, is, is a brilliant representation of that film because the film itself is so concerned with that kind of sensationalist sensory overload. But does the trailer actually succeed in selling the film? That's a very different question. And industry data, I mean, we know how, how much money a particular film took at the box office, that, that's easily accessible. But the data as to whether a particular trailer is effective in increasing that market revenue, we don't have access to that. That's top secret inside information. Yes. Um, and, and one would like to think that there's a correlation between good trail and, and success. But you also have to remember how very few Shakespeare movies have really made much money. You know, Shakespeare in Love is by far the biggest grossing Shakespeare movie. Uh, Baz Luhrmann's William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet comes next. And then it's a bit of a steep step down before you get to the next lot. Most of them were disastrous. You know, when in the, the 1930s, uh, Reinhardt made a version of Midsummer Night's Dream for Warner Brothers. It was supposed to be part of a three film package. They never made films two and three because they didn't make enough money out of film one. It's interesting, one of our questioners picked up on that very matter of what might the outcome have been from the trailers that have been created. Especially interesting are the theater uh, production trailers that you spoke mm -hmm. of, in terms of how they're able to do it in, in a variety of ways. And the social media aspect, it, it, it left some of our questioners wondering if there was any enhancement in the revenue of the production or in the sales of the tickets for a particular performance. But I imagine that is a So there's, there's a difference between two different kinds of trails. So the, the, the trail uh, for the uh, live from broadcast, live from National Theatre, whatever version, um, uh, very often that is only made, I mean, that live from screening is right at the end of the theatre run. So whatever else the live from screening may be doing, it's not trying to sell theatre tickets because the run is now virtually over. Uh, it's trying to sell in its own way the, the broadcast because the broadcast needs to sell tickets. And, you know, it's wonderful as and when we're all back uh, to what we did in the before times that I can sit in the Browning Cinema on campus at, at, at Notre Dame uh, and watch a live from broadcast from the National Theatre um, uh, of a production that is just finishing its run in London. You can't do that for now. Um, but, but the trail for the theatre production itself, I take it that it's about that thing of getting the word out, right? I mean, we know how we used to know about theatre productions. We'd read newspaper reviews, but people don't read newspapers, let alone theatre reviews anymore. So how does a theatre company publicise itself? And it's discovered, I mean, the RSC was one of the leaders in this, that making these little web trails is a really good way of reaching out to find the right people who they would love to fill the theater with. Indeed. I'm gonna end with this one. There's so many questions that are so riveting and I'm sorry we're not gonna be able to get to them all, but uh, I wonder if, um, you, uh, if the, you noted the difference in Tamer's trailers for stage and video. Have you seen any difference between the trailers intended for an English audience and an American audience, for instance? or even a non-English speaking audience, if, they're, you know, if, they're, if they go beyond that. What, what I've seen of those suggests that there are particular ways in which things are, are, are analyzed to show that they don't read the same. And, and so you want to press slightly different buttons. I've not seen this specifically with Shakespeare films. I've seen it with, with other films where I can document what's been going on. Um, I think Shakespeare is, is a little more, of, of, as it were, a constant. Um, uh, and that the people who might be enticed to go to Julie Tamor's Titus are the same in the US as in the U Germany. Are they the same as in China? I don't know, because I don't know how the film was released, if it was ever released in China. It, you see the, the, the problem. It, it is that sense of being on the edge of an enormous industry 
of which we are dimly aware, but of which of whose operation we, we really know far too little. Thank you, Peter. And I uh, thank you very been, much. We're so grateful for you being with us. And I want to thank all of our uh, presenters today. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed today's event all and uh, will consider joining us for subsequent gatherings in this London Shakespeare Lecture 10th Anniversary Series. It promises to be insightful and engaging throughout. As attendees here today, you will be among the very first to receive further details on those upcoming gatherings. Uh, we hope that you and anyone with whom you choose to share the information will be able to join us. In the meantime, stay connected with us on social media and continue the conversation in the Think ND London discussion group. And finally, please allow me to plug and celebrate Peter and Boyka's 2020-21 book releases, respectively. You'll see them on your screen as we conclude today. And I want to offer a final thank you to the backroom team on this, the tech team uh, from the London Global Gateway, Notre Dame International, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Uh, and thanks again to Boyka and Peter. Thanks all for joining us and God bless.